a super state controlled by international bankers and international industrialists acting together to enslave the world for their own pleasure. Notice how McFadden saw the international character of the stockholders of the Federal Reserve. Another chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee in the 1960s, Wright Patman from Texas, put it this way. In the United States today, we have in effect two governments. We have the duly constituted government, then we have an independent, uncontrolled and uncoordinated government in the Federal Reserve System operating the money powers, which are reserved to Congress by the Constitution. Even the inventor of the electric light, Thomas Edison, joined the fray in criticizing the system of the Federal Reserve. If our nation can issue a dollar bond, it can issue a dollar bill. The element that makes the bond good makes the bill good also. The difference between the bond and the bill is the bond lets money brokers collect twice the amount of the bond and an additional 20%, whereas the currency pays nobody but those who contribute directly in some useful way. It is absurd to say that our country can issue $30 million in bonds and not $30 million in currency. Both are promises to pay, but one promise fattens the usurers and the other helps the people. Three years after the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, even President Wilson began to have second thoughts about what had been unleashed during his first term in office. We have come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled governments in the civilized world, no longer a government of free opinion, no longer a government by a vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. Some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. Before his death in 1924, President Wilson realized the full extent of the damage he had done to America when he confessed, I have unwittingly ruined my government. So finally, the money changers, those who profit by manipulating the amount of money in circulation, had their privately owned central bank installed again in America. The major newspapers, which they also owned, hailed passage of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, telling the public that now depressions could be scientifically prevented. The fact of the matter was that now depressions could be scientifically created. Power was now centralized to a tremendous extent. Now it was time for a war, a really big war. In fact, the first world war. Of course, to the central bankers, the political issues of war don't matter nearly as much as the profit potential, and nothing creates debts like warfare. England was the best example at that time. During the 119-year period between the founding of the Bank of England and Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, England had been at war for 56 years, and much of the remaining time she'd been preparing for war. In World War I, the German Rothschilds loaned money to the Germans, the British Rothschilds loaned money to the British, and the French Rothschilds loaned money to the French. In America, J.P. Morgan was the sales agent for war materials to both the British and the French. In fact, six months into the war, Morgan became the largest consumer on earth, spending $10 million a day. His offices here at 23 Wall Street were mobbed by brokers and salesmen trying to cut a deal. In fact, it got so bad that the bank had to post guards at every door and at the partners' homes as well. Many other New York bankers made out as well from the war. President Wilson appointed Bernard Baruch to head the War Industries Board. According to historian James Perloff, both Baruch and the Rockefellers profited by some $200 million during the war. But profits were not the only motive. There was also revenge. The money changers never forgave the czars for their support of Lincoln during the Civil War. 
Also, Russia was the last major European nation to refuse to give in to the privately owned central bank scheme. Three years after World War I broke out, the Russian Revolution toppled the Tsar and installed the scourge of communism. Jacob Schiff of Kuhn Loeb and Company bragged from his deathbed that he had spent $20 million towards the defeat of the Tsar. Money was funneled from England to support the revolution as well. Why would some of the richest men in the world financially back communism, the system that was openly vowing to destroy the so-called capitalism that made them wealthy? Researcher Gary Allen explained it this way. If one understands that socialism is not a share of the wealth program, but is in reality a method to consolidate and control the wealth, then the seeming paradox of super rich men promoting socialism becomes no paradox at all. Instead, it becomes logical, even the perfect tool of power-seeking megalomaniacs. Communism, or more accurately, socialism, is not a movement of the downtrodden masses, but of the economic elite. As W. Cleon Skousen put it in his 1970 book, The Naked Capitalist, Power from any source tends to create an appetite for additional power. It was almost inevitable that the super-rich would one day aspire to control not only their own wealth, but the wealth of the whole world. To achieve this, they were perfectly willing to feed the ambitions of the power-hungry political conspirators who were committed to the overthrow of all existing governments and the establishments of a central worldwide dictatorship. But what if these revolutionaries get out of control and try to seize power from the super-rich? After all, it was Mao Tse-tung who in 1938 stated his position concerning power. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. The Wall Street, London Axis elected to take the risk. The master planners attempted to control revolutionary communist groups by feeding them vast quantities of money when they obeyed, and contracting their money supply, or even financing their opposition if they got out of control. Lenin began to understand that although he was the absolute dictator of the new Soviet Union, he was not pulling the financial strings. Someone else was silently in control. The state does not function as we desired. The car does not obey. A man is at the wheel and seems to lead it but the car does not drive in the desired direction. It moves as another force wishes. Who is behind it? Representative Lewis T. McFadden, the chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee throughout the 1920s and into the Great Depression years of the 1930s, explained it this way. The course of Russian history has indeed been greatly affected by the operations of international bankers. The Soviet government has been given United States Treasury funds by the Federal Reserve Board, acting through the Chase Bank. England has drawn money from us through the Federal Reserve Banks and has relent it at high rates of interest to the Soviet government. The Dnipsatory Dam was built with funds unlawfully taken from the United States Treasury by the corrupt and dishonest Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. In other words, the Fed and the Bank of England, at the behest of the international bankers who controlled them, were creating a monster, one which would fuel seven decades of unprecedented communist revolution, warfare, and most importantly, debt.